بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وبعد. The topic today is a gender differentiation, particularly in Islamic texts, and this is a very important point uh, because what we find is that we find the Islamic texts. Uh, when we say Islamic texts, let me define that first of all. First, we're talking about the Quran. So verses in the Quran which talk about the male and the female, talks about men and women. We find uh, hadith texts, the statements and teachings of the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, peace be upon him, also talk about male and female. And then potentially you can even talk about uh, Islamic texts as, as being commentaries on the Quran or uh, potentially you know, books of Islamic law written by Muslim scholars. But those really don't fall into the category of like the source foundational Islamic text. So we're focusing primarily on Quran and Hadith. <clears throat> the reason why this is really important to talk about, first of all, is our context. The context in which we live is um, we find that people look at the Islamic texts of the Quran and Hadith in particular, and they try to read in different notions or different ideas of gender that they have depending on their own background and depending on their own uh, context and society. So what ends up happening is <clears throat> you have this um, offensive, defensive taking place uh, when Muslims or non-Muslims are looking at these texts. So they're looking at how the Quran is spoken about the male, how the Quran is spoken about, spoken about females, and usually because we live in a, a Western society, and I say we, coming from America, but Qatar is kind of a Western society, I guess. <laughs> you, can, you can say, I mean, the fact that we're speaking in English uh, but from an institute that is uh, from the East, quote unquote, uh, Qatar, shows the effect at least of westernization, of having a Western language actually being the medium of discourse uh, from an organization uh, where you know all of the people who work for it, they're all fluent in English as well, right? So, so I even if it's not a Western uh, country per se, it, the effect of, uh, of Western languages and Western culture plays a role a very important role. Uh, so when I say when I say we, I mean, you know, uh, the the influence of Western discourse uh, on Islam is important in our context that we live in. So you have uh, people looking at the genders being mentioned in the Quran and in the Hadith, <coughs> and you find certain arguments come about. And one of the discussions that comes about is this discussion of equality which is something very important in Western discourse when it comes to gender. And the importance of equality uh, is, is, is paramount and it's uh, part of all of these discussions. So I'll come back to that point in a moment. So because that is part and parcel of our discussion, it's part and parcel of the situation in which we live in, it's very important to discuss the idea of equality in Islam with respect to genders and look at why does gender differentiation actually exist in the text of Islam and what does Islam say about that. So we could start with the idea of equality. What does Islam say about the genders with respect to equality in particular? Well, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, in chapter 3, verse 195, He says, He says, then <coughs> He responded to them, or their Lord responded to them and said, Lord meaning God, Allah, responded and said, I will not allow the works of any anyone to be lost or to be in vain or to not have any effect or benefit whether it is from a male or a female. So one of the crucial points we get from here is if someone, wa someone was doubting that you know what the good deeds or even the bad deeds uh, of a male or female are somehow going to be differentiated this verse removes that differentiation and says no. In the sight of God, in the sight of Allah, the deeds of a person are considered to be the same. In terms of one person performs a deed of charity, the other person performs the same deed of charity, they have equal value. So what that means is, if we look at it from the framework of Islam, from an Islamic perspective, the most important part of life is fulfilling your purpose in creation of, of doing good deeds, earning the pleasure of Allah, trying to get to paradise, trying to avoid hellfire. So from that, from that perspective, we could say from a spiritual perspective, 
the spiritual status or the humanly status uh, of a male or the purpose of being human from a male and female is the same. They're equal, there's no differentiation between them. So from that perspective, there is an equality of the genders in Islam, in Islam which is built upon uh, a verse of the Qur'an and many verses of the Qur'an. Another verse, it says, Ya ayyuhan nas, O people, inna khalaqnakum min zakarin, inna min khalaqnakum min zakarin wa untha. We have created you from a male and from a female. Wa ja'alna, <coughs> wa ja'alnakum shu'uba wa qaba'ila li ta'arafu. And we have created <coughs> from you uh, groups and peoples so that you can get to know one another. Inna akramakum inda Allahi atqakum. That the most honorable you, uh, the most honorable among you in the sight of God is the one who is the most pious, the most righteous. In Allah Alimun Khabir. Allah is the knowing and the informed. So what this verse basically talks about is it says that the most honorable of you, the most noble of you in the sight of Allah is the one who has the most taqwa or the one who is the, has the most righteousness, the one who is the most mindful of God. So if you look at it from that perspective, right? So the first verse is telling us that spiritually or humanly at the fundamental human purpose level, we find male and female being equal. And equal using the word equal here. In this verse we're seeing that, it says the only way you can differentiate yourself with all these different groups and people and races and tribes and everything, and that includes genders, any potential differentiation that could exist in the human race, we, what do we find over here is, they says the only way to really differentiate is through that righteousness. So doesn't it, meaning that the ability to gain righteousness or to lose righteousness is equal across the board and is equal across, across the genders as well. So what's interesting about that is that that concept of taqwa or that righteousness is not something that is visible. You see, if it was race, it's something that's visible, it's perceptible, we can, we can, we can see it, we can, we can feel it almost, right? Someone has physical differentiation. Uh, even wealth differentiation is somewhat perceptible, you know, you can kind of have a feel for how much wealth the person is going to have. But when it comes to taqwa, it's something which is in the heart. So it's not perceptible, it's, you cannot even perceive it in any way. So if it's not visible, and people cannot perceive it, then that means only God can judge that. So if this is the only factor of differentiation between human beings that's legitimate and valid from an Islamic perspective, and on top of that it is something that is not visible, it means that there's no basis for discrimination at the fundamental level from an Islamic perspective because no one can measure that besides God. No one can measure that besides Allah. So that is an important part and that's why there's other verses in the Quran 449, 53, 32, that basically says, oh, uh, Don't ascribe purity to yourselves. Don't claim that you're righteous or pure. You're not allowed to do that. You're not allowed to go and say from an Islamic perspective that, you know, I am righteous or God loves me or I know that, you know, I'm doing good deeds because you don't know what you're, you don't know what you have. It's almost like a, I like to give like the, you know, those video games. You ever played a video game? You have like the two player game. And then they like, there's a score, you know, on the side, like even those fighting games and stuff. I'm trying to, you know, appeal to all genders here. You know, I know sisters don't play as many fighting games, right? But you have like the score and you have like the energy, you have like points on each side, right? So like those points, each human being has points, right? But the thing is, in life, it's hidden. You have like a point counter up here, like above you floating up here, but nobody knows how many points the other person has and how many points the other person has lost. So the, diff the, the, the criterion for making a judgment and saying, well, you have this many points and I have this many points, it's not allowed. So it's interesting what Islam did was it says, people differentiate based upon historically, right? They, ba they differentiate based upon race, based upon wealth, based upon the, someone is free or someone is a slave. They differentiate based upon tribe. And they used to differ and they differentiated based upon gender as well. Many societies would do that. But what Islam came and said, the only basis for differentiation is the one factor that is invisible to everyone else, and no one can ever know it. So therefore, there's no basis for that discrimination. All right? So this is an interesting point. And then um, <clears throat> I'm going to skip a few points here because we, we're limited on time. But uh, there's other verses that talk about the equality uh, of human being, uh, human beings. Uh, let's move on. So the next section is not just equality, but 
now that we've established that there's an inherent equality of genders between male and female, we also have to realize that when it comes to human beings, uh, when, it, when it comes to human beings, forget just gender, right? But when it comes to human beings, there are inherent qualities that differ. People are created with different inherent qualities, and people have different acquired qualities. Right? So this whole nature versus nurture discussion whenever it comes to um, gender issues or, or so many other issues, these things exist. People acknowledge that people are in inherently created with different abilities, right? So there's inherent qualities, there's acquired qualities. What are the inherent qualities? Some people are physically born with a little bit more physical strength than others. So some people will be, you know, their muscle mass is just not going to be the same as the muscle mass of somebody else, right? So what's going to happen is, you know, there has to be a, a room for differentiation. I don't know if anyone's heard of UFC or MMA, Ultimate Fighting Championship and all that, you know, wrestling, sp uh, any sports that involve a lot of muscle or strength or something like that, there's always different weight categories. That's a form of discrimination technically, right, legally, but why is there discrimination? Because they realize that there's inherent qualities that people are born with that differ. So some people are in a really heavy weight range like uh, Muhammad Ali, you know, rahimahullah, he was heavyweight, right? He heavy, heavyweight. And then you have all these other people, they're like featherweights and stuff like that. I don't know, Prince so-and-so, whatever his name was. He was some boxer or something like that. I don't know if you guys follow this, I don't. Um, but you have, you have to put them in different categories because everyone understood that they have been created in a different way. So that happens when it comes to physical strength. It even happens when it comes to wealth, right? People are born into wealth as well. It's not only acquired. So it could be acquired wealth that people get uh, from the life opportunities they're given. And it could be wealth that has been inherited from uh, their family members or gifted from, from somebody else or whatever it may be. So you have these differentiation. You have weak and strong in society. You have young and old. You have poor and rich. And what happens is there's this diversity that exists in terms of both inherent qualities and acquired qualities exists for two, two main reasons. The primary reason is Allah tells us in the Quran that it is a test. Right? Because Allah is testing people with the qualities that they've been given to see how they're going to act within the circumstances that they've been given. So people who have wealth, they're going to be tested with how they're going to spend that wealth. Are they going to be miserly? Or are they going to hold all the money and spend it just on themselves? People who are not given wealth, they're going to be tested by how they respond and how they react with the wealth that they're not given. So are they going to be patient? Are they going to, you know, try to you know, work, are they going to try to you know, do something, you know, all of these things. So the test differs depending on people's circumstances. The secondary reason, according to Alama Ibn Ashur in his tafsir, he says that if people were all the same, right, if they, if they were the same across the board, then they would not actually be in need of each other. So another additional wisdom for actually having this differentiation is so that people will have to support one another not just as a test from Allah because of what they're doing, but also to make sure that you have people supporting one another so that they build what's called a community, and a family is a type of community. So there would be no concept of community if you were to put the opposite case. Let's just say everyone was equal across the board. There would be no intrinsic need for other people. So the ability to establish a community, the ability to have uh, reliance or strong bonds within family, would actually deteriorate. So these concepts would not be there had people not been created with different inherent qualities and had people not had the opportunity to have different acquired qualities. So when we look at all of that, we can take uh, an example of these two words that we use. So when it comes to gender, we talked about first of all equality of the genders. When it comes to um, their fundamental humanity, their purpose of life. But there's a different term that needs to be used now. So first we had equality in Islam. Now we have a new term called equity. And it's not here, but I'm going to write it down. And it's a very important term to differentiate. Like this marker and this marker are not equal because one of them has more ink than the other. And this marker is, suits the job better. Uh, so there's equality and there's equity. There we go. Is that right? Yes. So the difference is equality, if we look at it from a perspective of mathematics, what you're going to find is that 
if you have the number 2 on this side of the equation, right? In order for both sides of the equation to be equal, you have to have a number 2 here, right? But if you have a variable here, let's just add a variable here. Uh, you add over here. Okay, now um, are both sides uh, of the, are both sides of this equation uh, are they equal? Yes. Well, depends on the variables, right? Ah, so you're saying because of the equal sign, right? So it depends on what you're going to put in the variable. So the way e equity works is whatever you add to this side of the equation, you have to add to the other side of the equation. You can add different things on the side of the equation as long as they balance out, right? So now if I add this and I say, okay, hold on, I'm going to add a 1 here, plus 1, and I'm going to add a 2 here. Now what? Are they still equal? The equal sign is there. Alexander said because the equal sign is there, we know it's equal as long as you put in the correct x and the correct y. But now the question is, is the x and, are the x and the y equal? No. They're not in this case, right? So equity basically means that they're equal in the sense as long as you keep on adding things to both sides, but the variables, you can have a differentiation. The numbers on one side are not equal to the numbers on the other side, but at the end of the day, they equal out. That's the difference between equity and equality. And when it comes to the idea of, when we talk about gender equality in Islam, sometimes it's better to use the term gender equity in Islam because there is an inherent difference of qualities that exist between the genders. So people are going to have, let's skip a few parts, people are going to have different, uh, you know, inherited traits. They're going to have different acquired traits, right? So what is, um, well, let's take one example before we jump into gender, right? So let's take... Um, People who have acquired wealth, people who have inherit, you know, uh, inherited wealth, right? Versus people who have inherent wealth. The differences, right, between someone who has a lot of money and a little bit of money. Should we differentiate between them? Should we discriminate between them when it comes to um, giving them equal opportunity for getting a job? Should we? We should not. Okay, why not? Why not? They qualify for the job. Okay. No, no discrimination. It's okay. on merit, not wealth. It's on merit, it's not on wealth. Okay, so that's from their perspective. From the company's perspective, it's also from their merit. So from their side, it's merit. And from the company's side, the company wants to, you know, accomplish whatever it can. It just matters what, whatever the person has to bring, right? So we don't differentiate, right? How about, should we differentiate between people in their wealth when it comes to taxes, in terms of how much money we charge them? Monica says yes, <laughs> yes, they should. Anyone disagree? Well, depends on the policy. How depends on the po I know, Qatar is a different situation. I'm talking, from, I'm talking about from an American perspective. There's like no tax in Qatar, right? Wow. <laughs> yeah, so. So let's put taxes aside. Oh, okay. How about when it comes to giving charity? Should we just... You, you have a... Uh, there is a principle about um, um, having higher rates of taxation for the wealthy, lower rates of taxation. If you have the same percentage, it's going to be unequal. All right. So, 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 the, so you, you mentioned a really good point. She said if we had a different percentage of taxation for the wealthy and the poor, it's going to be unequal. But probably what you meant to say, right, what, what you actually were thinking when you said it's unequal, we know it's unequal. Obviously, it, it, you know, you, you, what you're saying is a different, if we, ha if we had the same percentage, it would be unequal. What's wrong with it being unequal? But it's unequal to begin with. You may introduce policies to reduce the inequality, mm -hmm. right? So you right. have progressive taxation. Right, right. But, but you're agreeing with the idea that there's a different tax levels for the wealthy and for the poor. Well, again, it comes back to... You're agreeing with the idea, right? Oh. Yes, okay, that sounds good. I want to be yes. clear. Yes, right. but <coughs> not, not on the basis of what you're 
try to put words into my mouth. No, no, <laughs> I'm not trying to do that. <laughs> I was just trying to build up one point that I was coming to anyways. <laughs> so what I was trying to say is that the, the wording which is used, right, intentionally or unintentionally, was that it's unequal. But probably what you were trying to say was that this achieves more justice, right? When you have a different tax brackets for the wealthy and for the poor, right? And what's happened today in the discourse is that we have confused the words equal with fairness, fairness with justice, right? And the problem is, is that the goal is not to reach equality. The ultimate goal is to reach justice. And we're hoping that in many cases, equality will result in justice. But not necessarily, it's always going to happen that way, right? So this is where one of the problems that we encounter is. And uh, Ibn Ashur mentions again in his tafsir, he says <coughs> that the idea of equality in legislation, the idea of equality in establishing laws is the underlying principle, but it can be overlooked when there's a necessity. Right? So what does he mean by that? What he means is that whenever you have a legal ruling, whether it's normal law or whether it's Islamic law or the Sharia or something like that, if you have a differentiated characteristic, because people have different characteristics, right? Inherent or acquired, it doesn't matter. If you have a differentiated characteristic and that's going to cause a conflict between human equality and human justice, the justice that we're trying to achieve, then you need to take that into consideration and abandon the equality which should have been the default and go with what is going to be reach justice right so what's going to happen is every time you have an opportunity right you say okay w people who are rich and poor <clears throat> we don't we don't discriminate between them when it comes to job opportunities right company's going to hire it's it's unjust to discriminate between them why so well because it's not equal we use the word equal but in reality, what we mean is it wouldn't be just, it wouldn't be fair to discriminate between them because they should both have the same opportunity because that's, that's how we define fairness, right? Let me just finish the point and then I'll come to you. But when it comes to taxation or when it comes to charity in Islam, like zakah, right? It's not going to be the same amount is going to be given by every single person. It depends on how much money you have. So we differentiate. Why do we differentiate? It's not equal anymore. There's inequality in taxation. There's inequality in charity, or in zakah in particular, right? Why does the inequality exist? Because the purpose was to achieve justice. And this, inequ this equality would have led to injustice. So when equality, is going, equality in legislation in the rule is going to lead to injustice, we override the principle of equality and we go with what is going to achieve justice. This is what Ibn Ashur is basically saying in terms of his argument. Is that similar to <coughs> the idea of positive discrimination? Or what I think in the United States is called affirmative action, um, whereby the principle of equality of opportunity uh, has a result of the same uh, in, in inequalities in terms of achievement. If you if you if you everybody starts at the same point, but some are disadvantaged, mm -hmm. uh, they're going to still be disadvantaged at the end of the race if we want to race. Exactly. So that you give some uh, um, uh, more of an opportunity. Uh, that is, you be positive. So, if, for example, in a job job application, uh, two people, a male and a female, for example, who are equal in terms of merit. Mm -hmm. Uh, you then choose the female over the male as a form of positive discrimination. The same with uh, issues of race in the United States, right. uh, which creates its own problems. But the the, the principle the, uh, that's exact that 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 is exactly the principle. That's precisely the principle. So the, for those of you who don't know about affirmative action, that's exactly the way that it works. Assuming that the presumption of the presumption and the outcome actually does yield justice, right? Assuming that's the case. So that's the way it does work. All right, so very good. So, uh, so, it would, so basically what he's saying is that it would be unfair to apply the same rules to all people when there are differentiated characteristics. So there's inherent and acquired qualities. Whether if, if people had acquired qualities, we can say, well, that is something that happened later. It could have been different. But inherent qualities becomes the bigger issue when it comes to gender discourse. If there are inherent qualities within people and they've been created this way, 
And if we were to apply all the same rules across the board, then what's going to end up happening is you're going to end up with the type of injustice that takes place to either gender. And that injustice is the reason for the differentiated gender rules within Islamic texts. So I'll start with the biological uh, differences in gender, and then I'm going to leave it to you know, Shoki to uh, go through some of the details of the text and figure out why, um, why those specific rules exist. So biological differences in gender are something that pretty much people understand on an intuitive level. Uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said in the Quran that you know from everything we've created two mates you know there's male and female have been created human beings they cannot reproduce without the presence of a male and female under normal circumstances unlike bacteria or something else so there's a wisdom in that there's basically there's a wisdom in why Allah has created human beings as males and females now if we look at the differentiation beyond the, just the physical differentiation we understand that there is a hormonal differentiation and a hormonal differ differentiation actually causes a differentiation in behavior or we can say in the psychology or the mentality of a male and female because of the type of hormones that they're usually going to be or naturally going to be uh, endowed with and if you find that when there's an interference in these hormones and other chemical processes within the body uh, of a male or female, you find that the interfering within this normal hormonal uh, regulation uh, is going to cause serious changes in each gender, and you can actually see the re you can see the manifestation of the differences uh, in particular aspects uh, of their body, whether not only in terms of like voice and uh, you know physical features, but even in terms of their emotional states or their psych their psychology. So there's so what happens is that. There are physical differences, but there are psychological differences. And one of the problems that's happened, I don't know what it's like in Qatar or people who are coming from elsewhere, but I can speak particularly for California, is that you know, the uh, intellectual trends of Western society, or Western society, I'm mentioning it because it's had a, po uh, a very strong impact on, on much of the world today. Uh, and especially the language we're speaking in is English, so therefore there's, like I said, there's Western influence, we're speaking English, the Qataris are speaking in English, the Qatari <laughs> professors all know English. So because of this uh, Western role, it's important to look at some of the intellectual trends and movements that have affected the perception of gender uh, differentiation when it comes to just the, the, the human being. So Western feminism is particularly one of those strong uh, intellectual movements. Uh, so this is a fairly recent phenomenon. You know, the term feminism, you know, feminism was coined in France in 1837. It's about 200 years old. Um, and in 2015, there was a poll across the a world, actually, where they wanted to see how many people identify as feminists. Right? And let me just define feminism real quick. The feminism has many dif different definitions, but it's basically, um, it's basically a movement which is advocating for uh, the rights of women in different spheres, whether it be work, whether it be uh, opportunity, whether it be so many other things. And there's different waves of feminism. There's a the first wave, second wave, third wave, different ways of classifying feminism. But it's somewhere along that line. So without going into details, I'm assuming everyone has at least heard of the concept of feminism a little bit. But to clarify it, 2015 poll, they surveyed uh, people around the world. And in America, they found out that how many percentage of people identified as feminists? What percentage would you think? 70%? 70. 70%? 70 Good guess. Anyone? 40 to 50%. 40 to 50%. Is it only men or women? Uh, they, men and women, they surveyed both. Combine. 40. 40? Okay, let's, let, let's remove the men and just say America, women. American women, what percentage would identify as feminists? 20. 30%. You, you, so you see, you'd say 40 and then down to 20? Yeah. <laughs> Let's gamble. Let's gamble. <laughs> Very good. He's the closest so far. It's actually 18%. 18%. Which is really interesting uh, because people thought the numbers would be much higher. But then they asked another question. So what percentage of you believe in equality for women? 
And of course, there's, a di there's such a subtle difference between feminism and equality for women because feminism claims to be trying to achieve equality for women. So what percentage was that? How many people, what percentage of people said, yeah, we believe in equality for women? 85%. <laughs> so, so from 85% here to 18% here, right? The only country in the world where more men claim to be feminist than women was Poland. So at 21% and 17%, which is interesting. I don't know what's going on in Poland. They were lying. <laughs> they were lying. Alhamdulillah. <laughs> So what you find is, you, you know, it's really, feminism is a huge topic, but without defining it clearly, without going into the de details and the nuances of it, we could say there's four very important works that have influenced American feminism in particular, that have had a role on, um, had a role in shaping the idea of, the, uh, what role the psychological differences between a man and woman should play or actually exist in society. So that's the whole point I'm, I'm talking about. Everyone recognizes that men and women are physically different. That's not a very difficult thing for people to acquire, right? But when it comes to psychological difference, people say, well, wait a minute, what are you talking about, you know? Uh, is that really true? Is that really that? So what has happened is that these intellectual movements have had a role in downplaying the psychological or emotional differences between male and female. So among them, you have four main authors. You have Mary Wollstonecraft. She wrote A Vindication of the Rights of Women, 1792 in England. You have Simone de Beauvoir. Beauvoir, is that right? Okay, pronounced some French word correct after three years in France. The, called The Second Sex, 1949. Betty Friedan, The Feminine Mystique, 1963 in the USA. Very influential book, probably the most influential book. Um, uh, for women in America, and Germaine Greer, Greer uh, the female eunuch, in 1969. So what's happened is you found... Uh, Australian. Yes, Australian. <laughs> Are you Australian? <laughs> there you go, yes. So Germaine was Australian, yes. Uh, so, but what's interesting about her, I'm going to talk more about her. So she wrote in 1969, but out of these people, she is one of the ones who 30 years later in 1999 wrote The Whole Woman and changed her entire perspective and said we were wrong in the feminism that we were promoting. And one of the points that she makes is she says we were downplaying the psychological differences between men and women and we weren't looking at the fact that these differences really exist, psychological, emotional differences. And she's saying that this has hurt women more than it hurt men. So we thought we're going to liberate all these women in the 60s and all that stuff. And in fact, we ended up harming women more. So there's more suicide among women. They're getting surgeries. They're getting this. They're made to cosmetic industry. They're being used. Pornography has gone up. She basically says a really interesting point. She says, we, we, tried to, uh, we tried to liberate women, but we moved them from one form of dependency to another form of dependency. They used to be dependent on their husbands and upon men, and now they're dependent on counselors, psychologists, and drugs. Right? This is kind of like her summary of what she's saying. So what happened is now you have these different uh, movements called like difference feminism, where they say, no, we, when we deny the difference between men and women, we are actually doing a disservice to women in particular. Since our goal is to help women, we're actually harming women more. So what her argument is, we're actually causing injustice by making the old equality argument. So which is kind of the point that I was trying to make in the beginning is that equality does not always lead to justice. That's what Ibn Ashur is saying, right? So he's saying that when equality is going to lead to injustice, we abandon the principle of equality and we go with something else that's differentiated, you know, legislation that is going to result in actual justice that we were trying to achieve in the first place, right? So. Because of that, we have all of these um, different, um, you know, characteristics. So we have, you know, physical muscle mass is different between men and women. They have, you know, men have deeper voices. They tend to be taller. They have, women have breasts, men have facial hair, etc., etc. At six weeks in the fetus, the male gets this large dose of testosterone that comes into the body. And beginning from there, you find these major differentiation that takes place between men and women. But on the psychological level, we find different things that take place. Some of, you know, most of this is solid. Some of it is still experimental. But I'm just going to quote the stuff that has really been uh, proven in the peer-reviewed literature, right? 
uh, in the little bit of time that I have. So, you know, they say men tend to work on, when men work on visual spatial tasks, their testosterone tends to surge. And which means that they're going to be more inclined to seek work as pilots, as carpenters, in the subjects of mathematics, in the, in the sciences. This is not to say that w women are not capable or they cannot change or they cannot you know, adjust their behavior to be in those fields. It means that there's an inclination from a biological level that men are tending more to that for this reason. Uh, they say that boys are less able to detect fear in the faces of people, which is potentially why they might be inclined towards rowdiness when they're boys and they say, oh, you know, boys will be boys on the playground and they're going to be a little bit rougher and all of that. There's, there's reasons for that that's intrinsic in them. It's not something that is simply socialized. But what's happened is Western feminism, or most strands of it, has argued that men need to become socialized. They need to be socialized to be more like women, and women need to be more socialized to be like men, and therefore we can actually you know, balance or we could uh, bridge this gender gap which exists uh, within our society. Whereas in Islam, we find that you know, Allah is talking about gender differentiation, or it, not only in legislation, but you find the absolute equality that we talked about in the beginning. But then he also says, unsa, that the male is not like the female, and there is a difference between the two, and there's no need to try to bridge uh, this gap between the two of them. So, I'll end with one uh, example, right? And this example is kind of like a warning of how our own culture can cause us to misunderstand an issue that's an issue that's not directly related to Islam, but if we misunderstood this issue uh, on, a public, on a public level, it can translate into a misunderstanding on Islam. So let me give you an example. How many of you have heard of the wage gap between the genders? Heard of the, all of you have heard of the wage gap, right? So what's the, what's the, what is the wage gap? 75 cents to one dollar? Close. 78 cents to a dollar, right? So what does that mean? That, that it means that for every dollar a man earns, a woman earns 78 cents, right? So, you have a comment. I see your hand, like, slowly coming up. <laughs> I have to define our culture. This is very subjective when you say our culture. Right? Yeah, yeah. Are talking about Islamic culture or the Western Sorry, when I say, when I mean Western culture. Okay. Yeah, like the way I define it in the beginning, yeah, yeah, Western culture, yeah. Yeah, yeah so, sorry, sorry, sorry. Culture or economy? <laughs> That's a good point. <laughs> they both kind of come into each other. You're right. It's a good point. Alhamdulillah. So, um, so, yeah, so from that perspective, okay, so like when I first heard this, you know, I heard a Muslim comedian saying this, but what's the problem with this? The problem is that the assumption that the person has in their mind is that Kenny and Monica, for example, they both go and work at Starbucks. Which is an example, okay? And Don't. <laughs> so Ke Kenny is making fifteen dollars an hour, and Monica is making twelve dollars an hour for the exact same job, exact same position, exact same amount of hours. They both work weekend or weekdays, and we're saying, hey, this is this is completely unfair, right? That's the assumption that most people when they hear about the wage gap, that's what the assumption is, right? But that's actually misleading because that's not what the wage gap is. So the figure that's quoted, right, has actually now, according to even many feminists who are, who are actually defined themselves as feminists, they say, we need to stop quoting this statistic because it's a false statistic and it's misleading and we're actually doing ourselves disservice because when people realize the data behind it, the data has just been manipulated to make it seem like that's the case, but it's not the case. So the reality is, it's an aggregate of all wages across the country between men and women. So what they don't factor in is that they're not in the same role, Men and women don't work the same amount of hours per week, right? So this assumption is there. So men are working more hours on average. They're not in the same role. They did not look at the difference in pay and uh, all of these other things. So let's say you have an engineer, man and woman. One is working 70 hours a week. One is working 40 hours a week. One is working weekends and one is working weekdays and just clocks out. Their salaries are different. Can you say, you know what, look at this unfairness. They have the same position. They're both engineers but their salaries are different. That would be very misleading to present that figure. So what ends up happening now is you have people who look at that. And then you go on the flip side and you say, well, let's look at the other gaps that exist. There's an education gap, right? Women graduate much more from college than men. 
I'm sorry, guys. I don't know why, why this is. It's not surprising to me. You know, since I run a university, I see the same thing. Uh, there's a violent crime gap, right? Men are killed way more than women. So are we trying to achieve equality in that field as well? Would we like to see equality there? I Probably not. There's a dangerous job gap. Men tend to be in all the dangerous jobs. There's a death in the workplace gap, right? Men die more in the, in the workplace. There's a life expectancy gap. Women live three to five years longer than men. So we should probably try to get some equality in that one, you know? <laughs> but, uh, right? So what's happening is that the discourse in our culture, our Western culture, uh, tends to make us think a particular way which begins to translate into the way in which we perceive Islamic texts. And that is going to be Shoki's discussion. So I was just setting that up for him, and he can continue the rest, inshallah. Yeah.